You don't need someone on YouTube to tell you that the Coen brothers are some of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Their filmography oozes Americana, especially their more comedic stories, with characters from all over the world with varying beliefs, casually carrying guns, and money underpinning their individual goals. I recently watched Burn After Reading, The Big Lebowski, and Fargo, which made me notice certain trends in the Coen brothers' work. In all of these somewhat comedic movies, their true genius lies in their decision over who the protagonist to the story should be. If we boil down the key plot elements of The Big Lebowski, it's the story of a wealthy man whose wife has been abducted and he needs to pay a ransom for her to be returned safely. You could just picture who the protagonist for a movie like that would normally be. It could be a cop, a negotiator, or the husband himself, someone strong, earnest, considered, motivated. But instead, the Coen brothers pick this guy. The dude is the protagonist who always seems to be playing catch up with what's really going on, as he is actually a bit stoned throughout each scene. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. In Fargo, the essence of the story is two criminals are hired to abduct a man's wife so they can split the money with the husband and return her safely. But the plan goes awry, resulting in multiple murders. In a typical movie, you could picture a heroic, hard-boiled, obsessive cop who's burdened by their own past to be given a case like this. But instead, we get Marge. Oh yeah? Oh you betcha, yeah. A heavily pregnant, good-natured, earthy local police officer. You see something down there, Chief? No, I just think I'm gonna burp. And we get William H. Macy as the spineless husband, Jerry. You darn tootin'. All of these characters seem to respond to the homicidal plot with utter nonchalance, as if all of this violence is not huge news, despite all of them living in a relatively quiet and inactive part of the country. Says the last guy thought he's a jerk is dead now, so I don't say nothing. He says, what do you think about that? And I says, well, that don't sound like too good a deal for him then. In Burn After Reading, the essence of the plot is an ex-CIA analyst is blackmailed after his private documents fall into the wrong hands in a plot involving the Russians, private eyes, and the CIA. On the face of it, it sounds like a political crime thriller with sinister villains involved. But instead, the Coen brothers make the blackmailers Linda and Chad, two naive gym workers who don't even seem to realize that they're committing treason. In all of these stories, the characters never identify the stakes involved, as they are typically blinded by the pursuit of their own goal. Jerry never seems to realize that hiring goons to abduct your own wife is a serious crime, as to him, the ends justify the means. He feels dwarfed and emasculated by his father-in-law and needs to clear his debts. He never thinks about the potential negative ramifications of his actions and even seems to forget about his own son at times. Yeah, jeez, Scotty. Yeah. Linda's goal is to have her cosmetic surgeries so she can find a great man to settle down with. She discovers that cosmetic surgeries aren't covered by health insurance, and this feels like an injustice to her. So the moment Chad finds the CD of Osborne's information, she becomes transfixed on this as the sole solution to her problems and the two engage in blackmail. On paper, the dude's goal should be to get Lebowski's wife, Bunny, back at all costs. But his main personal goal is... All the dude ever wanted was his rug back. And to make some easy money that will prevent him from having to get a job. He becomes embroiled in a plot between lots of sinister and powerful people, shifted from one limousine to another like a pawn on a chessboard. And this is what the Coens have mastered. They take unserious people and insert them into seemingly serious situations. But how do they manage to misplace these characters into these plots in the first place? Well, it's usually down to the incompetence of the other players in the story. For Linda, Osborne's wife Katie's lawyers drop a CD of his data in the gym, which Chad accidentally finds. Burn After Reading essentially takes the tested formula of what if top secret government information fell into the wrong hands, but instead of it being foreign adversaries, it's ignorant civilians. And instead of top secret information, it's a fired alcoholic's memoir. 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 For the dude, Wu pees on his rug after they mistake him for someone else. 
For Jerry, he hires two incompetent goons without knowing enough about them, as he delusionally expects the situation to play out with ease. They can't seem to get anything right together. Even in their very first meeting, both parties were told different times to arrive. Shep said you'd be here at 7.30. What gives, man? Shep said 8.30. We've been sitting here an hour. A key theme throughout the Coen Brothers movies is the hustle for cash. Money is what drives these characters into situations they don't belong. They're desperate and broke, yet have this expectation that they deserve more than their current lot in life. Instead of coming up with a brilliant business idea, they come up with a bright idea to make a quick buck. They then struggle to let go of the initial rush of the idea, even when it fails. And this gradually makes their life consistently worse. The Coens use these characters to explore the question, why do seemingly good people do bad things? And the answer appears to be that they often don't even really realize that what they are in fact doing is bad. What you're engaged in is blackmail. That is a felony, that's for starters. If you look at a philosophical concept like determinism, the view that everything in life, including moral choices, are predetermined by previously existing causes, then in essence, we are only free to choose from the set of ideas we can personally think up or that our social circle suggests. So whenever we make a decision, we are all victims to the information we are aware of at the time, but also persuaded by what we hear the most. This is what dooms the Cohen's characters to failure as they are heavily influenced by their own social circles and personal experiences up until that point. The dude's key social circle are Walter and Donnie, all of whom have totally different temperaments, which creates regular miscommunication. We're talking about unchecked aggression here, What the dude. fuck is he talking My about? My rug. Forget Come it, on. Donnie, you're out of your element. Walter is the dominant voice in the group, and that makes him a key influence in the dude's life which is unfortunate, as Walter mostly wants to be credited as the wise veteran whose guerrilla tactics work in everyday situations. I got buddies who died face down in the muck so that you and I can enjoy this family restaurant. Right, I'm out of here. Whereas Linda's key influence is Chad, who has no critical thinking skills, so he only echoes her own ideas back to her. This makes the two characters feed off one another, and this allows them to feel justified in committing bigger and bigger crimes, from blackmail to breaking and entering to treason. Jerry has no one to confide in, so starts to take his swindling tactics in the car dealership to outside the office too, with no one to slap some sense into him. The Coen brothers are the ultimate American storytellers, with characters of every background, with varying temperaments, beliefs, and goals that they then let loose in a free and chaotic world where money talks. We embrace these characters and understand their motivations, but then the Coens juxtapose the character's belief of what is about to happen against the oncoming harsh reality. It's as if there are two stories working in tandem, what the characters think they're doing versus what they're actually doing. For example, Jerry tells Carl that the ransom is $80,000, and they can split that 40 grand apiece. But in reality, the ransom is a million dollars. Jerry thinks he will get away with this, but in reality, Wade doesn't even trust Jerry enough to pull off the drop due to his prior incompetence, resulting in Carl getting the full million after he shoots Wade. So everything Jerry has been plotting and sacrificing throughout the story has all been for Carl's benefit. Katie believes that she is divorcing Osborne for a serious partner, but in reality, Harry is not a serious person. He just likes to pretend to be one. You know, you really are a negative person. So we have someone with real intentions making real decisions for an insincere person. The dude and Walter believe that teenager Larry Sellers has their money, causing Walter to destroy someone else's car. But as it turns out, there was never even any money involved, as Lebowski had kept the money for himself and was using the dude as a scapegoat. The Coens throw these characters into plots they don't belong in, so that they don't even realize the stakes of what they're doing or the true nature of the people that they're dealing with. They're blinded by their own motivation, which almost belongs in a different story entirely, so that when the time is right, they can merge the two worlds with totally separate motivations together into one big moment, and let the collision unfold the only way it was ever going to. Ah! 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 
Well, you've made it this far, so you might as well like, subscribe and comment to help get this channel to the next level.